Hello, Roman world. Ready for a palate cleanser? We've kind of had some walled wall murder lately, so let's step back and consider the nice, friendly world of Roman engineering. Uh, people still die, though, and uh, yeah, there are oppressive working conditions, but you, you know, it's a different flavor of oppressive working conditions, so yay. Ugh. At any rate, bear with me. And let's take a tour of the Roman aqueduct system and places adjacent. We're starting with this map. Uh, the German stuff isn't necessary. Don't let it freak you out. I'm starting here because these are the major aqueducts feeding the city of Rome. This is one of the things that Romans got right. Uh, I've mentioned previously, they realized that water had something to do with the rate of disease. That's why they begin draining marshlands. Also, marshes are hard to have marketplaces on. But they notice after a while that fewer marshes equals less malaria. But then they also begin to notice that upstream water creates better health, health outcomes than downstream water. Now, Romans didn't invent the concept of aqueducts. However, they do take it and run with it. Early forms of water conduction systems are attested way back into the Bronze Age. So this is uh, often billed as like Romans woke up one day and they were like, ah, we should have aqueducts. And they invented it from nothing like everything. No, that's not how invention works. Invention comes from collaboration, cooperation, and a plurality of ideas and cultural contexts, because diversity is good for you. Now, back to the city of Rome itself. You'll notice there are quite a few aqueducts feeding into the city. Uh, some of the ones you're looking at here are multiple aqueducts put over the same tract. You'll also notice they're coming in from quite a distance. Uh, the closest one is the Rogo di Papa. It's also one of the, the last ones. Not, not all of these are for drinking water. The ones that are closer, the ones coming from existing lakes, some of them we know were just constructed to fuel the bathhouses or uh, the wastewater system. Um, there were gray water systems that were helping with the general flushing of the city. This is part of the city's waste management strategy too. Now, old school, I would have told you, this is a great efficient system that continues to flush water into the streets, thus flushing trash out of the city. Archaeology doesn't really support that. Uh, probably in practice, what we're looking at is nasty, nasty streets kept damp by a constant flow of low water pressure um, wastewater. But it's better than it would have been. So uh, not quite a gold star here to the Romans, but uh, participation trophy. This is where public health engineering starts. And public health engineering has been one of the major life-saving things humanity has figured out how to do. Uh, it's hard for us to see because we live in a world with pervasive water systems. But just imagine for a minute your life if you didn't have running water, if you didn't have sinks, you didn't have showers, it wasn't really easy for you to get fresh water from a good reliable source. I mean, if you live in a place with high lead contamination, then you know that feeling. This revolutionizes the relationship people had with hygiene, with safe food, with safe drinking water even, before safe drinking water, and here I'm talking about Rome because this does not produce universally safe water. Alcohol is what you drank to have safe drinking water. You'd water it down a little bit, but even so, you were drinking massive amounts of alcohol day to day, and this just isn't great for your liver, but this was how people lived before the late 18, early 1900s, at which point temperance movements took over. But temperance movements and non-alcoholic drink cultures can only happen, or at least almost only happen, 
in a world where reliable sanitary water is a thing that you can get. Okay, so you've met the aqueducts from afar. Let's look at how this pours into the city of Rome proper. Oh, sorry, before I go farther, I should also explain another part of why so far. These rivers are not occupied. The only city really on this river system that's on the map is Rome, but upstream from Rome there are suburbs, there are villas, there are large factory farms, and if you've lived anywhere in a farming region, and I grew up on the Shenandoah River in part, and also the, the Capon when we lived in West Virginia, um, I didn't need to list all the river systems I've been on, but trust me when I say I know from rural river systems, farm runoff creates a river system that you can't safely go into, that has algae blooms, that has uh, high bacterial loads. So even if you just start with the farm runoff, you get river systems that don't produce safe water. But then also these are river systems that not just animals, but farmers are pooping into. Um, animals are dying in, peeing in, pooping in, and, and that's how animals do. And this all comes together to form an unsafe drinking water situation for people far downstream of these areas. So by the time the Tiber is flowing into Rome, you can't drink out of that. That's not safe. These aqueducts then start, you'll notice, far, far upstream in the headwaters of the rivers feeding into the Tiber. That's on purpose. And a lot of the technology we're about to look at is covered and purpose built in order to preserve the cleanliness of the source water, to keep it out of the way of contaminants and to bring it in as uh, close a condition to its source as possible into the city. And in large part, this works pretty well. This is safer drinking water than the drinking water you'd get from the Tiber. Now, the disadvantage to this system is that it places an even larger wastewater load on the Tiber. The Tiber River itself was and still is a bit heavily polluted really unsafe. Not just unsafe to drink, but unsafe to swim in. Um, people are not just doing their laundry in it, but laundries are dumping their waste into the river. Uh, you may recall laundry waste is fuller's earth and urine mixtures. So the river is full of bleaching agents, it's full of heavy metals, it's full of tanning byproducts from the leather industry. It's a really unsafe situation flowing out to the Mediterranean Sea. Just icky, icky Tiber. And this is something that early environmentalists point out and lean on too, so it's not like it went unnoticed. Yay. Here are the aqueducts coming into the city of Rome itself. You will recognize the hills, I'm sure, from the first unit we did. And this gives you an idea of just how many aqueducts it took to keep Rome supplied with safe-ish, running-ish water. Now, if you look at the outflows, they're coming to the edges of the city and they're staying on the hills. That's important because aqueducts work by creating a constant gradient from source to outlet um, with some asterisks. And these endpoints of aqueducts aren't where you go get your water. We're not done yet. That's not how municipal water supplies work. These are the end tanks. These become urban reservoirs that then further split out into pipes going around the city. However, you will notice economic disparities within that. Uh, the red lines are minor aqueduct lines, and some of them, yes, are serving areas like the um, Campus Martius and eventually the, the baths that are there. But most of them are going to our usual elite suspects, the Palatine, the Aventine, which uh, by the late empire, this was 
fancy. It got gentrified, did the Aventine. Um, similarly, the Kylian starts a little podunk and then it goes gentrified. I can say podunk, I'm from Appalachia. It's cool. Um, the Esquiline, likewise. Eventually, there's one running to the Vatican. It's a very late one. All right. Here is what these aqueducts would have looked like inside the geography of the city of Rome. This is the one that's running closest to the Roman Forum up to the Palatine. And you'll notice it's kept quite high. It's up on these arched bridgeways. Now, these are stacked in part because that's a more stable structure, but each row on this aqueduct system would have contained a different aqueduct. So part of what happens when you get to the city of Rome is multiple aqueducts are combined into a single course because you don't have a lot of spare real estate in urban contexts, and you don't want to mess with people's homes any more than you have to to run an aqueduct into the area, especially rich people's homes, am I right? There were a lot of Roman laws that were meant to keep people from effing with the aqueducts, because apparently it was a bit of a problem if an aqueduct blocked your view, um, some one percenters would tear down bits of the aqueduct and that would of course cause a disruption in the water supply and hork people off so in general they tried to stack them and to keep the space use efficient the arches provide structural stability yes but they also let the light in so you're not blocking too much of the urban view this isn't so much like a train track situation you can cross it uh, but it still was considered unsightly when we look at it and we're like oh my gosh look at the pretty roman arches but for romans they were like why do i have to look at the water supply like i look at my building and their aqueducts this is the same kind of attitude you get towards elevated tram systems which is one of the reason why our public transit system is totally underdeveloped we could do better public transit is important um light rail is awesome we should have more of it europe has more of it we should too what's up with that <clears throat> sorry i'm just very passionate about public transit and full disclosure i married a civil engineer so although i myself am just like horrible with the mechanics of this i have um an inordinate amount of affection for civil engineering and architecture although he'd be very mad at me for mentioning architecture. Apparently there's a rivalry, who knew? At any rate, uh, Mr. Spouse is a civil engineer and I find that very, very attractive. Not that you needed to know that about me and my priorities, but mm, engineers. Okie dokie, what were we doing? Uh, yes, the aqueduct. So here's the one running by uh, the site of the Flavian Amphitheater or Colosseum. It's also running by um, one of the Imperial Fora. So this is in an area where it's mostly municipal architecture and um, some wealthy sites, but it's a, it's a business district. It's one of these areas where running aqueducts aqueducts doesn't cause a lot of trouble, but it's also adjacent to wealthy neighborhoods, which means that wealthy people still get their water. All right, so let's look at the mechanics of the aqueduct before it gets to the city, because this is cool. Now, as I mentioned, in, or, in, or, bleh, in order to run an aqueduct from its source to the city, you have to maintain a constant gradient too steep and the water pressure inside the system destroys the system too shallow and the water stagnates and doesn't maintain a constant flow and water pressure so you have to keep this gradient gradient just about right this is challenging because land doesn't run on a constant gradient that's not how nature works so in order to build an aqueduct you have to come up with a solution 
for going over land that doesn't follow your plan. The way Romans did this was through a combination of underground tunneling and bridges or siphons over valleys, or at least low-lying dips. Now, the other thing, by the way, with aqueducts is you can't have a lot of turns. If there's a turn, you're putting water pressure onto a wallway, and that's not great. Uh, if you have too steep of a turn, you're going to have to put in a settling tank and then redirect the water once it's stopped moving and then start it again. You can do it, but you want to avoid doing it as much as possible. And that's why aqueducts run in a mostly straight course. Sorry about the bumping image. My cat is bumping her head into the computer. Yeah. If you're so interested, why don't you just come here? <clears throat> Now, you can't run the water directly into the source. You need to have a covered intake that's going to ensure that the water going into your system is as free of silt and other undesirable particulates as possible, which is what we have going on in our diagram. These water sources were often man-made reservoirs where existing headwaters were dammed in order to create a nice um, lake that could maintain constant or at least semi-constant water depths at all times of year whether it was flood or drought because if that source water gets too low you're not going to feed the aqueduct with the constant pressure it needs so from this intake we go into the hill now this looks like half the aqueducts under a hill when the majority of an aqueduct's run is going to be cut through rock and this was because building archways was expensive these are less stable than tunnels cut through hills and in general they're going to be proof from whether they're going to maintain a constant temperature so the freezing risk is much lower keeping the water running also tends to offset the freezing risk but the further north you get in the empire, by and large, the more of the aqueduct is going to be buried underground. Another thing to keep in mind is earthquake resistance, because the Mediterranean's on a fault line. So aqueducts try to maintain as little over the ground presence as possible. When they're under the ground, they go for flexibility. Even so, earthquakes could and did disrupt the operation of um, aqueduct systems. This was one of the early warning signs that Mount Vesuvius was about to blow its top. Weeks before the explosion itself, there were a series of earthquakes that damaged the aqueducts so much that there were water sh shortages in the Bay of Naples. So if you ever find yourself in an ancient Roman town and there's an earthquake and the aqueduct goes down, maybe get away from the mountains is my best advice. Now, there's another more depressing angle to this. This is structurally better, but from a human rights point of view, not so much, because the digging of these shafts was done with enslaved labor, often convicted criminals, and this was not by any means a fair judicial system, because as many disparities as we have in our system, or where we could try harder, but we are at least trying to be fair about the way that we assign blame and hold people accountable for their crimes, in ancient Rome, they were kind of trying, but uh, trying to be fair was in its infancy still. Uh, Roman law had enshrined into it different tiers of social status that directly impacted your punishment in the system. If you were of high social status, you would not be sent to dig aqueducts. But if you were of low social status and you messed up, like you're accused of stealing, uh, say, oh gosh, what else could you get sent to the mines for? Um, stealing, plotting, beating people up, violence, slander, 
There are kinds of ways that you can get sentenced to hard labor, either in the mines or in the construction of aqueducts. Now, many of these were made with military labor, but that doesn't mean that there are no enslaved people. Enslaved people are part of the system. But the military is also involved. One of the things that Roman legions began to do and invested heavily in once we get into the empire is using on-the-job training to create a corps of engineers of a sort. So the designers of the aqueducts, the project managers, supervisors, got their training through military service. Similarly, a lot of military officers as part of their duties would have to supervise mine operation, aqueduct systems, um, my dude Pliny the Elder, this seems to have been his mid-career job, was as a mine inspector and supervisor. Just nifty sauce. As I said, I like civil engineers. They're nifty. <clears throat> so this brings me back to the tunneling. On the, the first diagram, you can see this on the second diagram too, uh, you see how the tunnel runs through the hill with inspection shafts that are somewhat open to the air. You'd put a cover over it so that excess dead animals couldn't fall into it. Once there's water flowing through the system, that's how you check to see if the water's still flowing. These are very narrow channels, all of them dug by hand. There's no dynamite in ancient Rome. And if you're in there being lowered through the inspection shaft and the water starts running again, you can be sucked into the system. Uh, you'll die. You'll drown. You don't survive being sucked into an aqueduct channel. And your body parts would have to come out the other end of the settling tank. Now, not just you. Animals will get stuck in the system, too. So part of what you'd have to do through the inspection shafts is get dead animals out of the system without drowning yourself. There is some good news here. There were ways of shutting off the water at the source and at different points in the flow of the aqueduct. Uh, there were diversion channels. There were settling towers where the water could sit with, while you were making repairs. And so this isn't necessarily something that you're going to die every day you go to work to fix a problem in the aqueduct. But there's no OSHA compliance in this system, and there's an exploitation of labor sources that are already getting a bit of a hard shake from the system. And some of them are hardened, horrible criminals who deserve to be stuck down a mine shaft. Because there are some, like, I, I don't hold murder much. I think that's kind of. It's tacky, it's destructive, don't do the murder. Um, but uh, this isn't a system that does a really good job of finding guilty people and punishing them in a way that is uh, fair. So this means there are a lot of innocent convicts dying in these water systems. But also, even if they're not innocent, human life is important. I think they have value. I don't really hold with uh, endangering people in some kind of state custody. That's, you know, it's not about them at that point. It's about what the state's doing to human beings, <clears throat> which is neither here nor there. We're talking about engineering right now. But engineering is never far from ethics. And in fact, those of you getting your engineering degrees know that you have to take ethics courses to be an engineer because in historical circumstances where ethics has been kept at a distance from engineering and where engineers don't get a thorough training in how to think about ethics, how to design for ethical operation, horrible shit has happened. Um, see also Holocaust and Werner von Braun for that matter. <clears throat> yeah, he's he's not a sexy engineer. Just putting that out there. Uh, what were we doing? Yes, right, aqueducts. Now, 
at the end of the top system, you see one of these settling tanks I was talking about. These are important and they're put at regular intervals through the aqueduct because even in a closed system, an aqueduct will pick up silt, but then also from the source, there is going to be some sand and pebbles and whatnot being pulled along with the water. You want to minimize the amount of that coming out at the end of the system and settling tanks are how you do it. Once you're in the system and flowing at a constant rate, the water is slow enough that particulates will settle to the bottom and settling tanks will arrest them on their way down. But of course, this creates areas where you're going to have to dredge every once in a while to remove the sediment to keep the system functional. Hence the inspection shafts, hence the OSHA violations here. At the bridge, the channel is moved into a covered and less airtight system. There's a little bit of a gap between the surface of the water and the tiles covering the bridge. We'll look at that on a future slide. The bridge is one of two strategies to deal with dips in the land. Now, bridges are great because they can work over unstable riverbeds, uh, they're a little less tricky to build. Once Romans get good at building arches, they can stamp these babies out quickly and efficiently. And it does create a somewhat safer situation for aqueduct workers, although not really. I'll explain why in a minute. The other strategy that we see employed, especially in areas where there's a lot of cold weather, is the inverted siphon. You're familiar with a siphon if you've ever cleaned a fish tank. If you create negative pressure inside a pipe, you can move water from a higher location. I'll do this on the slide image. So from a higher location to a lower location. There we go. Is that? There we go. Um, sorry, other way around. From a lower location to a higher location. I'm doing this wrong. Um, I should have made Mr. Spouse do this. Uh, from a higher location to a slightly lower location. There we go. That's not wrong. And indeed, that's what we see here. One end of the siphon is just a little bit higher than the other end of the siphon, but between these two points, there's a dip. So this is a way to make water flow uphill but it only works if there's no air in this system, at least not a lot of air, and you need to keep up constant water pressure. The way this happens in the Roman aqueduct is that just before the siphon begins, there's a rise in the roof that allows the water to pool and collect and build pressure at the top. As it falls down into the siphon, it's going to speed up, and cause increased water pressure. That water pressure will be enough to then push the water on the other end of the system back uphill. And once it gets going, it'll continue. And as long as that's just slightly lower than the beginning point, you're going to be able to maintain water flow. Now on the other side, it's got to slow down again. So you've got another one of these higher ceilinged areas. This allows the water to splash, settle, and then resume its pace into the rest of the system. It's pretty brilliant. Some of these still work. 2000 years worth of serviceability is pretty I'm good for an engineering project. And indeed, aqueduct principles are still one of the tools in a civil engineer's toolkit for getting water into a city. It is an efficient use of energy. It's an elegant system. It can be made safer by like first not employing enslaved labor and or military conscripts and or uh, convicts, but also through safer inspection methods and better water shutoffs. So, so the ideas are pretty sound here. This I will give a gold star, not human rights, but you know. <clears throat> okay, here we are looking inside of an aqueduct in Germany to give you an idea of what these 
channels through mountains look like. This one does have a little bit of a gradual curve in it. You can get away with this in a mountain because it's a mountain. It's got a lot of structural stability once you cut that arch into it. It's it's going to hold up. And indeed, it's held up. This is a 2,000-year-old aqueduct run in Germany. You can see at the base from the final stages of this aqueduct's life a, a lot of rubble that's collected on the bottom as people stopped servicing the aqueduct and as other bits of the system broke down, this stopped being an active water channel. But you can see most of it's still exposed, including the coating of waterproof concrete on the inside. This is Another thing we're going to talk about moving ahead a little bit for Romans, but this is one of their major achievements. One we didn't reverse engineer until 2013. It's just that freaking brilliant. So a combination of uh, waterproof and water setting concrete and also plaster was used to seal off the rock inside the mountain from the aqueduct. You need to do this because rock, all rock isn't created equal and rock is porous. If you don't seal the system off, your water is going to eat its way through the sides of your system, and that's not ideal, is it? So you carve it out of the mountain, you cover it with a layer of uh, waterproofing and sealant, you put inspection shafts at intervals, but in general this is a very tiny space, right? Uh, an adult cannot stand up in it. Small people carve this out, a lot of them children, which is where this gets slightly more depressing. This was a legal system that did convict children to hard labor and enslave them. So one of the uses you'd put your underage tiny workforce to is uh, carving out the small bits of the inside of the aqueduct. Uh, you don't want this too large because you do want it to maintain water pressure and be um, easy to hook up to siphon systems and, and so on. Here's another water channel, this one with water still in it from a functioning a bit of aqueduct. I'm showing you this separate from the last one to point out to you. Let me get my. Uh, a red pen here. This bit here, that is not the waterproof concrete. The waterproof concrete you can see along through here. There are tiles and cut work that have been overlaid with the waterproof concrete layer. On top of that, there's this white kind of porous material. These are chalk deposits, and this is another kind of low key brilliant thing Romans did. They picked water sources that had a high mineral content. They went out of their way to put hard water into the system because hard water coated pipes and added to the protection of the water over the system's length. So uh, the, co the concrete is only part of what's sealing off the system. That's going to wear down over time. And if you have caustic water, it's going to wear down faster. But if you have water that's depositing minerals rather than eroding minerals, you're going to have water that helps increase the integrity of the system. And it's a lot easier to send your maintenance workers in every now and then to chip away the chalk deposits than it is to send your workers in to repair the plaster and the concrete. Safer too. So uh, yay. This is one of the few remaining overground aqueduct sections. This is the Pont de Gare. It's in France, and it's a bit of aqueduct traversing a river. Well, that's obvious. You can see the river. It's right there. Uh, I have a couple of things to say about this before we look at its innards. The very top course is the only bit that has water going through it. The rest of the arches exist to raise that top level so that you can maintain the slope. You'll also notice that there are some bricks that are sticking out on the sides of the aqueduct. That's not messy. That's 
the access system. Now, I mentioned earlier that while well, it's slightly more safe to maintain the bridges, it's not all that safe. This is because your maintenance workers would be climbing up these projecting bricks up the side of the aqueduct and onto the top to do their maintenance work. And the higher you get on a bridge system, the more wind there is. The wind shear at the top of this is quite intense. So it, there might have been some rope systems to help keep you safe, but in general, this just isn't uh, isn't an OSHA compliant workplace. Again, I don't think there's such a thing in the ancient world, really. Also, there's no OSHA. Uh, the other thing that's cool about this, and much less depressing, is in the piers. Uh, now, this is a little bit harder to see, but let me draw a circle around one of these. These aren't just flat surfaces projecting into the water. There's kind of an arrowhead shape in the bits of the piers that are next to the water. This is because when a river floods, it creates intense stresses on any kind of bridge structure built over the water. Romans understood this. So one of the ways that you mitigate is that you create points like the bow of a ship to cut into the water and encourage it to flow around the sides of the pier. If you keep this front facing area flat like it is up here, the water is just going to smash into that and floodwaters have immense amounts of pressure. You very much don't want this to happen to your aqueduct because it will fall over and then you have to rebuild it and it's this whole thing and it costs money and people die so eh. putting that pier system in is still something we do in bridges that are over medium-sized rivers and it's something you'll see if you're driving along the highway and you come to a bridge check out the piers of the bridge and look for uh, the oval or pointy arrowhead shapes that keep the water from pushing the bridge over. I find it comforting myself. Don't look up at the bottom of bridges though, that's um, distressing, especially if you're on a road trip with an engineer. Like Mr. Spouse cannot help himself. He'll be like, oh, that iron's corroding and who's inspected this? It's been far too long. This bridge is about to collapse. There is the failure point right there. And it's like, on the one hand, I'm fascinated by this, and that's really interesting, but also we're in a car on this bridge with the baby. We really need to invest in our infrastructure, I think is what I'm saying here. Okay, I promised we would look at the top of the Pandugar, and that's what we're doing up here in this here picture, top left. In the far distance, you can see that the course of the aqueduct is covered, and that would have been true for this entire area. This picture was taken by someone at the top of the aqueduct who was working inside the water channel here. This is all water flowing through. You would keep tiles over top of it, again, because dead animals are a thing. And not just dead animals, birds poop, and they like to stand on top of bridges and poop. You don't want birds to poop in your water. You know, Romans didn't quite get how badly you need birds not to poop in your water. But you do. It's important. If you were being sent to service this aqueduct, um, I should also point out like this side bridge here, that's modern, that uh, wouldn't have been a thing in antiquity. So you would climb up the sides, get to the top of the aqueduct, stand on the top of the aqueduct, and then you'd have to pick up one of these tiles. They're modular, but they're pretty massive. Imagine having to pick that up, standing on top of this pretty darn narrow bridge with winds blowing at you, and up your nice Roman tunic. This is um, not my idea of a good time. 
and this was a, a pretty dangerous thing. So again, this is a system that killed people on the regular. So one of the prices of having running water in Rome was dead people, which is why workplace safety is so important because nobody should have to die to have fresh drinking water. That's unnecessary. We can do better. And I'm being ranty about this because it still does happen sometimes. I mean, not as much, but you know, it's, it's a thing. Okay. At the end of the system, you have distribution tanks, which is what we're looking at down here. Yeah. That there's a distribution tank. The water from the aqueduct is going to pour into this central area. And it's round because round is a really good shape to control water that's swirling. Water forms a natural vortex as it pours into an area. And round is much more structurally sound. It's harder to break round. So when you have water pressure hitting an area, you want that curvature. We saw that in the channel as the aqueduct course was turning inside the mountain too. That, that bend keeps your hydrodynamics safe. Okay. The other thing that would happen in these swirling tanks, uh, not necessarily this one, there would have been a few tanks before you get to this one. First, you'd have a final settling process where you'd get the particulates out of the water. When you finally had your cleanest possible water, it would go into this tank and then connect to a number of water mains, which is what these holes are for into these holes would be slotted large terracotta pipes we're not quite to the lead yet but there's going to be lead eventually because there's always lead but here terracotta pipes make more sense it's easier to make large structurally sound ones you can make them rounder so that they can handle the kinds of stresses that you're putting on them uh, these are made to slot one into another, kind of like in a nice segmented worm. And then the cracks were filled in with uh, concrete or mortar to you know, keep the system going. The water mains don't go directly to the distribution areas, though. I mean, not unless it's going to a settling tank in a bath complex. Rather, these water mains go to districts, and then there's further splitting later in the system which we'll get to in a minute. Part of why they're at the bottom of this tank and not the top of this tank, well, first, you want them to be at the bottom where the water pressure is going to be constant because it's at the bottom of the tank. Uh, the currents aren't going to be quite as turbulent there. There still be a little turbulence, but not a ton. It's a little bit up from the floor, though, to get that last little bit of sedimentation out before it goes. These are the tanks I was talking about, all of them put together from one particular um, aqueduct endpoint. This is the uh, Santa Fiora Nymphaeum, the Santa Fiora spring system. Uh, this wasn't very well maintained at the end of its life, and that's what all this brown is. You can see where uh, the settling tanks have done their job, the mud is there, so nice good job let's see anything else i want to say about this eh. no no that will do okay. where is the the forward there we go now i promised you lead we're at the lead now you may recognize the Roman word for lead from the periodic table, but for those of you who have wondered, why PB? Why don't we just call it lead? Um, this is one of these original elements where they were making the periodic table and they were like, oh, no, that's it in Latin. That's much classier. Call it plumbum, which is where we get plumbing from. Uh, plumbing originally was made out of lead pipes and indeed continued to be made out of lead pipes for far, far too long, which is why we find ourselves in the pickle we do today with lead pipe systems and shitty water treatment. 
<clears throat> Michigan, parts of Baltimore City. <clears throat> Though, um, I'm being cranky about this because this is a crisis we are currently in the process of doing a very bad job of fixing because it's expensive and uh, America seems to really hate paying money to save poor people's lives and brain function. It just is sad. It's so sad. Um, however, Lead piping isn't the most dangerous way you can put lead into the environment. Oh, no, that belongs to tetraethyl lead and gasoline, which is was a horrible idea that never should have happened. 20th century dicks. Um, this is neither here nor there, though. Romans are not burning gasoline, so gold star. In fact, the... I've made a big deal out of lead poisoning in the ancient world, but the average lead load coming from all of these sources of lead contamination in the Roman Empire is still lower than the average lead load of someone in the 1950s and 60s in an area with widespread automobile driving. Tetraethyl lead was just that bad. It's not that Romans were just that good. It's it's that we seriously fucked up um, in the 50s with lead. And I'm sorry about the F-bomb, but I think if it's warranted anywhere, it's warranted in unnecessary loss of brain function and neurological function. That's just, that's not acceptable, especially not when people get rich off of it. That's that offends me at a level that only an F-bomb can quite express. So <clears throat> there we are. I stand by that opinion. Where were we? Right. Settling tanks. <clears throat> this is the inside of another one that's more complete than the last one we were looking at. The last one was missing its top. This is what the top looks like. The window is there so that aqueduct workers can look in and check water levels and make sure that uh, nothing is going awry with the system without like crawling into the tank this is a good safety feature because inside the final tank in an aqueduct the the currents were violent if you fell into this you'd be falling into a whirlpool that's immediately going to squish you against a rock side Settling tanks are still unsafe. Please do not fall into a plumbing system. Not that, I, I hope that's not a relatable concern, but I just feel like I should warn you. Because gosh darn it, this is a practical life lesson class. All right, so on to the lead pipes themselves. You're looking at one. I took this picture in Ephesus in Turkey. So this is the course of the lead pipe. You'll notice that it's built into paving stones and it's exposed a little bit. Um, this is a feature, not a bug. In order to access the pipe to repair it, you needed to be able to get at it. So what's happened is the paving stones on this side and this side have a gap and then the, the lead is nested inside of it. You'll also notice that there are divots and bumps in the lead. This has happened over thousands of years again. This is an Ephesus pipe, so it's been there for about 2,000 years, give or take. The flexing and bending is one of the features of lead that makes it so attractive for plumbing, especially in earthquake zones, because it's got to be able to bend and flex as earthquakes happen, as traffic vibrations hit it, as water pressure is variable. Also, lead is cheap-ish as metals go, and it's very easy to work at room temperature. Uh, I recently found out from one of my students doing a project that a lot of women would make lead pipes in um, home contexts because it is so easy to work without a lot of fancy forging equipment. Now, down the side you'll see this crimp this is how the lead pipe is made. So this is a sheet of lead. You can see kind of the way the lead sheet is running this way. That's rolled out at a 
steady thickness. You can see the thickness here where the pipe is shifted enough to show the seam. Uh, here, there's a solder mark still in place. So that seal's held really well. Um, this one is in need of some maintenance. They've taken the sheet of lead and they've rolled it around probably a dowel rod to keep it the right inside width. We know that the inside width was regulated by municipal water systems in order to control who was getting how much water. And then the, the side there with the crimp is how you would seal the lead. You would fold it together and then you would roll it down like the top of a paper bag and that would create the crimp of your lead pipe. Um, you'd press it to keep it sealed, but you were essentially done. You didn't need to do any soldering work until you'd laid the pipe yourself. I think, let's see, this is on the next slide, I hope. Oop, we're not quite there yet. Lead pipes would often connect to shutoff valves in order to make the system modular. We still do this with plumbing systems. Yeah, you don't want to have to shut off the whole water system to be able to fix a break. Romans knew this, and that's what you're looking at here. Now, this and this, those are the lead components. And you can see the solder here and here where it's connected to the central part. But you'll notice a color difference here at the join. That's made out of bronze. And that's important because bronze needs to be hard enough to um, move rigidly for this. What you would do is you would put a dowel rod here and here. Actually, I think this one you'd have to like clamp on either side. Some of them have this open so you can put a stick through it. And then you uh, turn this. And it twists an inside cylinder that turns on and shuts off the water. This is exactly the way that we still do faucets. When you turn the handle on your faucet, you're turning an inside um, doohickey. I'm sure it has a name, but let's, let's just call it doohickey. That allows the water to flow when you twist it back you put it with the closed side facing the pipes and then that shuts off the flow of water old old idea this one's a classic oh sorry and you use bronze because bronze doesn't corrode much uh, you might get a little bit of a green patina on it but in general bronze will maintain its structure in the presence of all kinds of water and this means it's not going to stick as much when you turn it on and off. This is important because you can't lubricate plumbing much without getting oil in the water and that's not good. So you want something that's going to fit very tightly but maintain its structure in the presence of water. That's what bronze does for you. Uh, copper as well, which is why copper is still a big gold standard in plumbing. Copper maintains its integrity in the presence of water. It's flexible, but it's, uh, it's expensive, especially expensive compared to lead, which is why so much with the lead. Okay, at the end of this system, most of the time, these pipes will be leading to municipal fountains, which is what you're looking at here. Up here is a small municipal fountain in a Roman era village in France. This is pretty typical. You'd have one of these on street corners and this would service an entire block. You, you may notice that it's a very small stream and there is no spigot. That's purposeful. Most of these don't have spigots. It's just going to continue to pour out water at a steady pace and either people will be filling it all day or when people aren't using it, the excess water is going to spill out of the catchment basin into the street and then become part of the system that, uh, on a perfect day, flushes waste slowly and gradually into the storm sewers, but probably is just making things disgusting and damp. Uh, however, 
disgusting and damp is relative. Without putting water onto dust, you're going to end up with um, a lot of dust pollution in the city from people walking through these dusty streets. And this isn't just dust. There's animal dung in this dust. Chicken dung, donkey dung, horse dung. And breathing in dung gives you diseases. Many, many diseases. So as disgusting as it is, mud is the lesser evil here. I mean, mud is disgusting, but mud is harder to inhale. At least one would hope. Uh, you can, it still gets on your hands. It's a wonder, wonderful fecal oral route for disease transmission. But if I were playing ancient public health, would you rather? I'd go for the mud personally. Now. On this other image, we have a large municipal fountain. This is the major fountain in the city of Corinth, one of these big metropolitan areas. Not the only fountain in Corinth, of course, but it's hefty. And it's still got water in it. Uh, when I was here, it was on a hot August day, like well over 100 degrees. I had heat stroke because I overheat so easily. Uh, pity me in a Baltimore summer. But back in the back, you have two layers of shade, and then there's water back. See here where there's, sorry, these deep doors, those lead to the water channel. So the water is just ice cold. And oh my gosh, just even standing next to it was amazing. Um, they had to pry us out of this bit of the archaeology to go look at the rest of Corinth. Our, our tour guide was, I love geology, don't get me wrong, geology is fantastic. But he really wanted to talk about the bedrock geology of the city of Corinth in the sun. That should be against the Geneva Conventions. We could have talked about it in the fountain house, is what I'm saying. This area in the middle, back in the day, would have been part of the fountain, too. It would have had a large reflecting pool, and there's all of this empty space around the side where people would have gathered. This was the social hub, especially for uh, women and children, because most households didn't have dedicated running water, one of the gendered chores of running a household was leaving the house to go get water and bring it back to the house. For a lot of women, especially in the Greek mainland where, where Corinth is, one of your only opportunities to leave the house and socialize was to go get your water. So this area was made into a really pleasant hangout zone. So this would have been one of your major socializing places and uh, a community building area. Uh, likely there was some good shopping there too, because you can't all fill your water jugs at the same time. You've got to wait. It could take a while. It could take a long while. And everybody's got to wait. And you can't you've got to have water, so this is a, a rock-solid excuse to go see your friends and have some fun. Um, on the downside, you have to carry a giant water jug, usually on your head. Um, I tried that once. Do not recommend. It was highly unpleasant. I just hats off to people who do this every day. Now here we're looking at private residence pipes. Sort of. Uh, the top one definitely is. You'll notice it says Yuli uh, Aya. This means uh, the pipe belonging to Yulia. This particular Yulia, we know which one it is. This is Livia. Um, her name while her spouse was alive was Livia Drusilla. You may remember her as Augustus's wife. This is that Livia, but because of the way Roman wills worked, when her husband died, he, in order to give her 
some of his property, adopted her in his will as a daughter because you couldn't give your stuff to your spouse, but you could give stuff to your daughter. So for us, that's a bit creepy, like your spouse is adopting you as their kid. But for Romans, this was normal and not creepy and didn't have any ick attached to it. So this was part of uh, Livia's villa when her son Tiberius was emperor, and we can date it because she's using the name Iuliae and not um, Liviae. It's leading to a house that we know was hers. This one is unquestioned, which is unusual for residences in the ancient world. Now, it's got her name on it because this is how Romans tried to regulate rich people from taking too much water out of the system because if rich people get to hog all the water coming out of the aqueducts there isn't enough left for public fountains however wealthy people like having running water in their houses so the way that Romans managed this is that they would sell you a pipe and it had to have a regulation internal diameter and that would control the amount of water coming into your residence and you, you would use that to fill a reservoir that was your domestic reservoir. We call that a cistern sometimes too. And then you would have further pipes coming out of that cistern to service your house. In order to get around this, um, wealthy Romans would take wooden wedges with their regulation pipes and then like hammer the wooden wedges into the pipes to make the inside bigger because lead is soft you can make it expand a little bit and that's how people would cheat the system because that's how rich people do often not all rich people but but enough that I'm going to be super salty about it I do not have information on whether Julia that is the Empress Livia was one of the offenders the next one here though um this guy does not get a pass for me. You've met him too. So let's read starting here. So that's his prynomen C period. Caius. Um, and then this is Caesaris because this is, uh, for those of you who Latin, this is genitive, right? So this is the pipe of, the pipe belonging to Gaius. Caesar, Aug is Augustus Germanicus. So Caesar, Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. Um, I mean, yes, he's one of the many Gaius Julius Caesars, but this particular one is the one who actually goes by Gaius. This is the Emperor Gaius. This is Caligula's pipe. This is not just Caligula's pipe. But this is Caligula's lead pipe from one of his two pleasure barges on Lake Nemi. Uh, the rest of, we dug up these barges from the lake bed shortly before World War II, and then they were bombed, so they're gone. We don't have the wooden bits of them anymore, which is gosh darn disappointing. But this pipe was one of several that fed fountain water features on the boat. So this was like a boat with running water. And not just running water to like wash your hands and mix your wine with, but running water for the fountains. These were just ludicrously expensive boats. They had rotating dining rooms and there was like a shipboard garden. And these things were huge, just massive, massive ships whose only purpose was to float around on the lake. They weren't, there wasn't an outlet big enough to get them out of the lake the only thing you could do with them is just kind of float around on them but they included an entire temple to isis I... this is some ludicrous government spending here so i i'm calling the emperor gaius out on this one some of the stuff people said about him is questionable and specious but he spent a ludicrous amount of money on his pleasure barges and that we can pin on him this is 
unacceptable, Emperor Gaius, unacceptable. He probably had a golden toilet. We don't have evidence of the golden toilet, but I would not put it past this cat. Okay, so you got in the water into your house. You have a cistern. How do you get the water out of the cistern and into your house? Kind of like we do now. Romans had spigots and pumps that look a lot like modern spigots and pumps. This is one of them. Um, the reconstruction shows you the innards. So you have an arm here attached to two arms with uh, all of this is bronze for reasons aforementioned uh, there are these inverted pipes here and here the hollow pipes as you pull up they create a vacuum that sucks water into the system from tanks below uh, that's where the the water is coming from and then as you do this this feeds water into the system here and then sucks it up this central pipe that then feeds in here to the spigot outlet. Well, that's a lot of messy drawing, but you get the point. Um, here is the actual find. We've had to reconstruct some bits of this, but this is a pretty full spigot. And we have other spigots that look a lot like this. So this is a um, well-attested Roman spigot that we see in elite houses, but also public buildings too. Uh, in Ephesus, there's this large, almost palace complex that may have been uh, a court building, maybe also a governor's mansion. And the first thing you see when you walk in are these fountains with spigots attached, where there, there are these basins that would have been used to wash the gunk off of your feet so you didn't track that into the courthouse. This here is, um, if memory serves, a reconstruction showing bits of this system, although this might be an actual ancient model. Um, it's also made out of bronze, and bronze has a tendency to last really well, but I, I think this is a reconstruction, so it's just a bit too clean. Now, this isn't the only kind of spigot outlet you can have. This is a much more basic one. So here is a lead pipe running this way. And oh, well, this side is sealed off. So the water is coming in from this direction, feeding into the pipe. And then at the top, we're missing the handle. The handle would have gone through this slot at the top. But you turn it, and it would send water through the outlets here and here. These uh, bits at the bottom are for housing the, the bottom part of the spigot. And again, this still has spigots work. Now, uh, this isn't like hot and cold running water next to each other. This is just a two spigot system. So that, like, if the one spigot's not fast enough, you like, have two so you can spigot faster. Um, Although the other explanation, and I think it's more reasonable, is one of these spigots is going to a water heater and the other one might be just going directly. Or this might be a splitter where each of these outlet pipes, because they're broken, we don't know for sure, but they might have led to different parts of the house for different usage. And this spigot system here isn't for turning the water on and off at the outlet, but rather turning it on and off up the system so if you need to fix the plumbing you have a shut off valve oh gosh i forgot to say what the other fountain was that's that fancy fountain in ephesus for washing your feet <laughs> sorry um but now you're probably wondering what's going on here or not wondering because this is also a familiar activity at least i hope so for a lot of you um, how do you poop in the ancient world, you may ask? Well, uh, pretty much the way we do today. Although, not exactly. Now, most of the pooping and peeing going on in the ancient world is going on right in domestic spaces. You would 
poop into a pot and then carry it to the closest outlet or throw it out the window. We know this because there were laws against throwing poop on people's heads out your window, which meant that people were doing it enough that there needed to be a law. Uh, these laws also seem to have been rather difficult to enforce. But we start to see the rise of the public latrine in the first century in uh, purpose planned cities. These public latrines, however, have some severe design flaws. One of them being you poop into an open pit. There is some water flowing through the system, which eventually will take the poop away, but there's enough poop left that we can still analyze it to figure out the parasite load of the average user of these public latrines. Uh, my colleague here from another institution is demonstrating enthusiastically the use of the latrines. These are also part of an outlet system. There's gray water running along these channels through here that's going to be important later. So keep that in mind. We'll, we'll talk about why that's there in a minute. Um, hopefully not for people to pee in, but I wouldn't put past them. The access channels here at the bottom, these aren't for standing up. It seems that Romans using latrines generally were doing it sitting down. Um, stand peeing. I guess you could technically do it in here, but this doesn't seem to be space usage. Although we do know that standing up to pee was a thing for people whose plumbing accommodated that kind of thing. Uh, we know this because Pliny the Elder tells us there was a belief that when you pee, you should do it up against a wall or a building or something so that the gods can't see you and they don't get accidentally offended because you've just flashed them and peed at them. So you, you do it up against a thing. Oh, so many questions, but this isn't that lecture. Here is what this might have looked like in a domestic space. This is a novelty toilet. You'd put your pot on the inside of it and then you'd sit on your chariot toilet to go poo. So this is someone who liked a multimedia sports pooping experience, as people do. Now, back to our latrines for a minute. There is sewage, lots of sewage, inside of channels, and we're missing the top walls of this, but you can see walls here, walls here, there would have been a roof over it. So this is an enclosed area with open sewage. Think for a minute about perhaps the last time you were at summer camp using a john um that is latrine i shouldn't go with the, the idioms here the smell is overpowering yes we now add chemicals to these outdoor latrines in order to mitigate some of the effects of sewer gases but in general one of the byproducts of standing sewage in a closed room is a buildup of methane. And this is a culture that does not have electric lighting. So if you're going into a dark latrine, you're going to be taking a lamp with an open flame. Maybe not you, but somebody's going to do it eventually. And if it's on the wrong day and there's just enough buildup of sewer gas, that sewer gas can ignite and explode. Now, they didn't understand sewer gas. They thought that there were toilet demons who would lurk in the depths of the johns and that uh, you could placate them by you know, we sometimes find inscriptions on the inside of the johns meant to um, ward off uh, the activities of explosive toilet demons but also there seemed to have been rituals too that helped you deal with the anxiety of going to a bathroom that may rarely explode on you while you're going Something interesting about these spaces is there isn't any gender segregation. Now, this could be because few women are using it, but the majority opinion last time I checked is that you do have um, people of all genders sh sharing this space. Um, and not necessarily because it wasn't a space where 
some solicitation and and sexy times and violence were going on but in general these are the kind of spaces that are so unpleasant you're not going to linger there um if you want to beat up somebody and take their clothes bath houses are a lot better of a place you're also not exposing a lot of your body with the way ancient clothing works you kind of hike up your robes and nobody's going to see much so it's not necessarily a high exposure situation uh, might be a little bit crowded some people have tried to estimate the width of the average bottom by looking at how closely toilet spaces are spaced that's that's interesting i'm not sure if it's conclusive but creative i admire um what else did i want to say about this uh, but in general this this isn't really a, a sexualized place and before the victorian period pooping in public wasn't considered unnatural uh, in general there was a much healthier recognition of the universal need of everybody to poop and uh, hi kitty yes as, as tethys can attest uh if pooping is a natural function you shouldn't be embarrassed to do it while making eye contact tethys sorry i i shouldn't tell her business but gosh darn it it's it's a little bit unnerving <clears throat> in fact one of the hard selling points for indoor plumbing and toilets and dedicated bathrooms was that people found it inconvenient it was a real hassle to have to leave the room to go poo in a culture where you used to just poo there were chamber pots that were made so that you could poop in your room you didn't have to like leave your bedroom at night to go to another room to poop you just like hang your butt over the side of the bed and go um, there were ones that were made that you could use under your skirts you could just kind of like stick them up there poo and then put them down and if you had giant skirts nobody would notice um, the 1700s were an interesting time to be alive and then of course you'd get somebody else to take your poop pot away so it would be enslaved people and low status folk who were risking the wrath of the toilet demons to go throw away your refuse or you just put it in the streets too uh, one of the selling points one of the ways that we made our culture feel the way it does about pooping was an effort to create better public health and sanitation it was to encourage people not to poop in public not to poop in pots not to touch poop not to hand poop to other people and thus spread the poop around but to poop, put the poop directly from your butt into a closed disposal system the reason there's a u-bend in toilets is to keep sewer gases from coming back up and igniting and causing smells and nastiness especially before we had germ theory miasma theory held that smelling poop could cause disease and that's answer adjacent they're not wrong proximity to poop causes all kinds of disease um especially cholera cholera bad cholera very bad uh, so where am i going with this um we should be careful to look at this as a public sanitation win it's certainly nice that they're thinking about getting the poop away from the people as soon as possible but it would be a mistake to look at this and say oh yeah romans had a poop free cityscape uh, no no but they're trying a for effort romans uh, and this is an important first step on a road that eventually leads us to a healthier poop culture in some ways but it also leads to a culture of shame and reticence in talking about poop and also a, an embarrassed lack of frankness when it comes to the health of the parts with which we poop and pee that do lead to poorer health outcomes being able to talk about pooping is necessary to health right we shouldn't be ashamed of poop adjacent illness there isn't a trendy ribbon for bowel cancer but it's still 
it takes a lot of lives unnecessarily because we're embarrassed to talk to our doctor about poop issues. My basic point being, don't be embarrassed about poop, just put it somewhere safe and keep it off your hands. Don't say I never taught you anything useful. All right, I promised, now I'm gonna deliver. How, you might be wondering at this point, does one wipe in an ancient Roman lavatory? Well, I'm gonna start with the best option from the ancient world. Uh, the good news about this, it's renewable, it's reusable, it's washable, and it's soft on the butt. So if you're starting to get a little desperate about the toilet paper situation, you can have this one for free. Love the Romans. This is the Tersorium. Uh, now it's right next to a strigil. That's going to be important a few slides down the road. But for now, we're focusing on the thing that looks like a sponge on a stick. It's a sponge on a stick. Um, the one on the top is made with a little bit of sheep's wool too, so it's not always sponge, but sponge is the gold standard. This is natural sea sponge. One of the benefits of natural sea sponge is that although it holds water, so it's a little absorbent, it's not too absorbent, so you can kind of wash it out a little bit. The other thing that's good about this configuration is that it creates separation between the hand and the butt. This is important, yes, we've talked it about the dangers of fecal oral transmission routes before. Now, it's not that they know about fecal oral routes of transmission, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that maybe not getting poop on your hand is nice. And this is their solution. So the stick keeps your hand away from the poop. The spongy end is the bit that you use to wipe. And you don't have one of these for personal use rather they're provided in public lavatories you kind of expect them to be there like we expect toilet paper to be there um, the sources are a little unclear on how these are supplied or provided and we'll talk about about what you do if there isn't one of these but if you're lucky there's a tersorium now you've probably met one of these if you weren't familiar with it before um for those of you who are from a religious tradition where you talk about the crucifixion narrative for Jesus, you may recall that at one point he's thirsty and then they have this sponge on a stick that they dip into vinegar and water and they offer for him to drink. This is that sponge on a stick. So like that story is even more depressing than you realized. I don't know why more pastors don't go into that level of detail. Um, maybe because it's like not socially acceptable to talk about poop in church. Ugh. I don't know, right? Well, more on that depressing story later. I'll just leave it at that. There are more depressing sponge on the stick stories, but I'm just going to stick to the good news now because we could use some. Uh, that vinegar and water thing, by the way, isn't a one-off for the crucifixion. This would be kept in pots full of, well, vinegar and water. Uh, the vinegar kept it from developing an odor. They didn't know this is because it's also killing germs, but that's part of what's going on here. So there's more good news than bad news. Now, that hollow that you saw in the toilet configurations a while back that's so that while you're sitting down you can reach back with your sponge on a stick and get at your butt and give it a good swizzle and then you uh rinse it off uh, that channel of water that runs in front of the toilets is like where you rinse and then you stick it back in the vinegar pot for the next person who comes along and people generally don't seem to be stealing this much, I think because walking down the street with a drippy wet sponge on a stick, it's just not a good look. It's going to be conspicuous and it's, there's no point to it really because sticks and sponges don't cost a lot. Sponges wash up on Mediterranean beaches all the time, so they're cheap. Now, you may ask if this is the upgrade, if this is the, the gold standard of butt washing, 
what is the bronze standard of boat washing in antiquity? So glad you didn't ask. Here we go. Meet the pesoi. Pesoi is Greek for rock bits, so it's fancier if you say pesoi, though. And that's the word that we use as historians for these things to distinguish them from just rando regular rocks. And uh, luckily, our ancient Greek artists have provided us with a picture of someone using one of these pesoi. Now, for years, we'd find these and we would misclassify them as gaming pieces, even though they weren't near anything that was a game. They, in fact, were showing up near toilets a lot and people were like, well, maybe they're like playing checkers at the John. They were not playing checkers at the John. These are butt wiping rocks. And we have art from the ancient world showing them being used as butt wiping rocks, just like this art that you're looking at right here. Now, the nicer ones, and there are nicer and less nice ones, have a little thumb divot in them so that they're easy to hold on to. You need that thumb divot because these, like the sponge on a stick, like the tersorium, they were shared. They seem to have been left at sites where people went to poo so that everybody could have some. And this means that you are indeed touching poop. Now, the way that they'd handle this from a hygiene perspective was they'd wipe with the left and eat with the right. That's not, not super hygienic, though. And again, this is a culture without soap. So even though oil is a great way to clean for a lot of uses, it's, it's, it's not great for breaking up nastiness on your hands and preventing the spread of disease. You really do need soap for that. So that was the nice pesos, uh, pesos singular, pesoi plural. The one next to it that looks like a shard of pottery, that is a shard of pottery. That's a broken bit of pot, and they'd use that in a pinch. If not that, then they just use other rocks they found around the john, and if you're in the country, you just pick up a rock because it's the country and it's full of rocks. Now, if you're wondering whether or not this caused damages to people's anuses, well, yes. Yes, it did. Because wiping yourself with um, pumice stones, a lot of these are cut out of pumice stones or volcanic rocks. It's not great, right? Your, your asshole is um, sensitive. That's mucous membrane tissue. That's just not a not a place that you want to be rubbing with rocks. And this caused fissures, hemorrhoids, uh, rashes, secondary infections. Um, and then with secondary infections, you could get all kinds of other complications, ulcers, just bad. So the sponge on the stick was indeed a health upgrade. Because if there's one thing worse than fecal oral contact, it's creating uh, bleeding wounds in an area that you're using to wipe with stones that have other people's poop on them. It's a great way to give yourself sepsis sometimes. So if the exploding toilets weren't bad enough, this is worse. At this point, I would like you to, like to remind you of the next step. So you've uh, drunk the water, you've pooped in the water, you're eventually going to wash in the water. You're done with it. Now it's got to go somewhere. Uh, with all of the sludge it's collected from the streets that it's flowed through, it's going to go to a storm drain. Uh, just to remind you, in the city of Rome, this is the Cloaca Maxima, the, the uh, greatest sewer. How everything's greatest in Rome. They're just delightful people. Uh, here's the Shrine to Venus Cloacina. You'll remember this from the beginning of the class, but just to kind of jog your memory here. Hi, Katie. Thank you for helping. Now, to get to the storm sewer, you'd need outflow pipes, which design-wise are the same as the main distribution pipes coming off of the water tower of the aqueduct. Uh, this is what I was talking about with terracotta pipes. I took this picture in Ephesus in Turkey. <clears throat> now, the holes in the top, that's just time earthquakes, you know, stuff has gone down. But you can still see the design of the mains and 
because this is just a partial, you can see where one section of terracotta piping links up with another, uh, just like Lego bricks. You link them up and uh, they can bend and flex a little. These are inclined underground so that they all flow into a central storm drain, which will then flow out into the nearest body of water. In Ephesus, this was the harbor. In Rome, this was the Tiber, which would also go onto the harbor. And that's pretty typical. If you have a really inland city, then it might flow into the nearest marsh or bog or lake or farmland. Uh, but cities in the ancient world did tend to be coastal just because of the Mediterranean being what it was. Uh, inland cities, after a certain point cut off from harbor contact, didn't seem to achieve quite the amount of growth, although, again, this is a general rule, not a, an argument for absence here or anything. Uh, let's see, anything else I want to say about this? No, no, that about covers it. And then here we are in the inside of the Cloaca Maxima. These were built like every other part of the system to be accessible because they did need clean. In fact, you can see on the right hand side the modern outlet of the Cloaca Maxima. It's not the big arch, it's that tiny arch buried half underwater, half under sludge. Now, without workers, that sludge builds up until the storm drain isn't going to be draining anymore. So you need to send people in there to you know, remove blockages and knock gunk off the side of the walls and control the general nastiness. Uh, today they have properly paid workers with, you know, benefits and things in antiquity. Guess who? Enslaved people. I shouldn't be sounding so chipper about that because it's horrifying. Uh, there be being sent into these dark, dark tunnels with fewer access ports again than the aqueduct tunnels. And keep in mind, this is water that now has large amounts of sewage in it. And just like the toilets, that means sewer gases. So you take your life into your own hands every time you go down here with an open flame, and there are no flashlights in antiquity, so that's exactly what you're doing. You can try to explode it ahead of you a little bit, but essentially it's this dangerous, dangerous job. And for this reason, uh, the imperial household, which first starts doing clerical work for the Emperor Augustus, and then as the empire and the emperor position needs more and more civil servants to help with administration and with court running, but then also infrastructure. The emperor begins to take over infrastructure labor, and various public officials will be in charge every year, but you need a stable workforce. And this comes out of the imperial household. So the emperor himself owns more and more and more people, often these people are given freedmen status once they've been trained to a certain level or they've risen to a certain rank, but it's a job for life. So if you're wanting to know about the history of government service, government service in ancient Rome, a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff that makes a system run was done by enslaved and freed person labor. Now let's pause for a minute before we return to the question of baths. I've mentioned in passing Roman underwater setting concrete. I'm going to talk about it more now because Roman concrete is freaking awesome, guys. This is a formula that was so effective. Things built out of it are still standing around and in use in various bits of Europe, but also its recipe was lost for thousands of years. We only managed to figure out what was going on with this in 2013, and it took an international interdisciplinary committee from, oh, what was it, like Japan, Korea, Italy, the United States, Great Britain, I think France, to finally figure out what the heck was going on here. Romans 
had multiple concrete formulae, but the one that was really exciting and the one with the secret formula, secret-ish, not really a secret, we just forgot, was unusual in that it sets underwater. So most concrete has to set in open air because it needs to dry, it needs to cure, it needs to mature. Um, and not all concrete is waterproof when set either. But Romans had a waterproof, water setting concrete. And this was done using volcanic minerals that are only found from certain kinds of volcanoes. Uh, volcanoes that emit a pyroclastic flow with like a large ash cloud and then uh, collapsing like say Mount Vesuvius. This creates these minerals that will react with salt water specifically. So it's not just any water, it's gotta be salt water. And then they form crystals, which create the hard matrix of the concrete through a chemical reaction. And then this sets waterproof and water hardening. So they use this to build artificial water breaks in harbors. They use this to build artificial islands to put lighthouses on and artificial islands for just funsies too. Part of why they had to figure out this technology is because Rome's harbor Ostia is awful. It's a, a just shitty harbor that did not have the underwater clearance to hold the kind of sea traffic that Rome needed to be able to sustain to like run an empire. And they could only get around some of this by using the Bay of Mycenaeum where Vesuvius and Herculaneum and the Bay of Naples, sorry, um, is what we call it now. That only works so far. You need a harbor that you don't have to put things on a roadway to bring it to Rome, which is what you have to do with the Bay of Naples. So they figured out how to dredge the harbor to make it deeper, and then they figured out how to build artificial breakwaters to keep the sea from washing back up the Tiber. And to do this, they needed this waterproof concrete. However, once they figured it out, it was useful for all kinds of things, including making bathhouses giant and cheaply, but also creating structures like the one we're about to look at. This is the Pantheon. It's the temple to Panthea. Pan is all like pansexual um, pan, that that thing. And then Theos, like theology. So the Pantheon is the temple to all of the gods. Now, it's built in two phases. The front part of it, the porch, was built by Agrippa, Augustus's bro, and it dates to the reign of Augustus. Hadrian, of course, is a hundred years plus a bit, like I think he's about like 150-ish years later. Uh, Hadrian, well, no, that's too long, 120-ish years. Uh, Hadrian goes in to revitalize and revamp the building. So it started as a normal rectangular Mediterranean temple with a normal roof on it. Hadrian, though, along with his other hobbies, was really into engineering. He built more stuff than I think any other emperor. He's a record holder, not just in the city of Rome, but elsewhere too. And he was a major Athenian fanboy. So the city of Athens has so much stuff Hadrian designed and built for them. He's also the architect of Hadrian's Wall in Britain. It's that Hadrian, again, so, but that wasn't the only wall he was responsible for building and fortifying. There was a timber wall along the Danube border in Germany. So, uh, yeah, Hadrian, super into designing and building things. On to, uh, to get to the dome, we need to talk about the evolution of the arch. Roman architecture is all built around this refinement of arch technology. An arch uses a series of stones that are built into a bow-shaped structure with a keystone at the top, and the pressure of the two walls falling into each other, I'm trying to do it with my hands here, like that, um, holds the pressure from the arch together, but also and then here my hand is the arch now, everything pressing down on it from above, 
goes into either leg of the arch, so it redistributes the weight in a way that doesn't require you to have a solid wall. So it lets you build stable windows in a wall, and then it also lets you build stable entryways from one section of a building to another. And this works with concrete structures as well as it does with masonry structures. Now, if you take an arch and you build another arch next to it and another one, and another one, and another one, you end up with a thing called a barrel vault. Uh, barrel because it looks like the inside of a barrel and vault is a fancy word for a roof. Hallways in Rome are built like barrel vaults. Uh, they use this to make underground access tunnels. Uh, the emperors in particular like to be able to get from one major public building to another one without walking through the public. So there were all of these uh, what we call crypto porticuses uh, built underneath the, the street level of Rome. Uh, this didn't keep every emperor safe. You may recall that the emperor Caligula was stabbed to death in one uh, through the plotting of his uh, Praetorian prefect, Cassius Chirea, who uh, Caligula made fun of just one too many times, which is just to show you bullying is not okay. You might get stabbed. Not that I'm saying it's your fault if you get stabbed, that's victim blaming, but you know. Don't piss off your bodyguard is a, a good bit of life advice that I hope works well for you. Okay, so that gets us to a hallway, but it doesn't get us to a point where we can have really wide ceiling spans as such or intersections. So if you take one barrel vault and another barrel vault and you intersect them with each other at 90 degree angles, you end up with. Um, sometimes a thing called a groin vault or a stirrup vault. Uh, groin or stirrup because it looks like there are straps and ribs where the barrels meet each other. And you can do this again and again and again and again to form a ceiling structure, which is what we have like a third to the right here, just up top. However, if you take an arch and instead of just building out from it in a straight line, you instead rotate the arch, like a compass or something, all the way around, it forms a dome, which is still stable for the same re reasons that an arch is stable. If you do it right, it's trickier. The way that they manage to make the, uh, the dome structure more stable was by putting a hole at the top and you can see this here that round thing at the top of the dome it's a feature not a bug it's open to the air and it's called an oculus or an eyeball and you'll see why in a minute this creates a ring of masonry that acts like a keystone but for the dome rather than for the arch and all of the pressure of all of these um vectors coming in off of the vault walls goes to that central point at the top which then the ring because rings are very stable structures if there's equal pressure all around the ring and oh, no i shouldn't do it like this let's do it like this there we go that um holds a good deal of pressure and then keeps the dome up and this creates a high lofty expansive ceiling that looks super super cool which is why Hadrian's doing it in here but also this is a temple to all of the gods so it needs to be extra special but also you've met Roman gods yes they don't really like it if you make one of them feel less important than another one so by making it into a round structure, it doesn't put any one god at the most important place. Rather, they're all around a round table, as it were. And this lets you make a point about the power of all the gods and how they're all special in their own specially special ways. Some of them are more special than others. Now, one other thing to know about pouring concrete in Rome. The techniques look pretty similar. Our artist here is giving you a contemporary American 
concrete form. Now we don't only make concrete forms out of wood, but plywood is pretty typical. So you'll put up wood on either side. If it's something that you need a little bit more structure in, like higher walls, then you put rebar into it so that you have um, some metal and some flex inside. You pour the concrete in, you let it dry, and then you remove the wood, and then you're left with the concrete wall. For Romans, they did sometimes use wood forms, and we're finding more evidence of this as time goes on, but it was somewhat more typical to use brick facing walls, so they'd build masonry shells, and then they would pour the concrete into the center, and instead of rebar, they'd include larger rocks, often volcanic rocks, like really porous rocks, so that the concrete would adhere really well to them. And that would provide some stability and uh, solidity inside the concrete as it dried into one whole conglomerate rock. Now, depending on how much pumice you add to the mix and the kinds of uh, gravel and components you're putting into the concrete, you're going to get heavier or lighter concrete. All of these principles Hadrian and his team exploited to build what we see in the Pantheon. So here we are looking at the dome of the Pantheon as it appears today. This used to have a layer of bronze over top of it so it would be really shiny in the sun and look super pretty. The bronze was removed by the um, Borgia Popes, I believe, to make Bernini's um, columns on a um, canopy over the papal throne. It's this whole other story. In this case, it's kind of useful to us looking at this building because without the cladding, we can see where the marks are from the forms that were used to pour the dome of the, the Pantheon. And we can also see these step structures with little mini steps built into them. The mini steps are the access steps that would allow the builders and then the later maintenance workers to go in and service the building. The larger steps are from the stages of pouring the concrete for the dome. So they start at the bottom and they pour a wide ring with hev the heaviest well, not heaviest, the heaviest concrete one on the bottom of the building, but with medium heavy concrete. And then they build another ring a little bit farther in with slightly lighter concrete, and then the next ring up slightly lighter and lighter. And you can see this if you look at the color of the concrete from the bottom to the top of the dome. It gets whiter and lighter, and uh, the, the texture changes just subtly. That's not a coincidence. Part of how Hadrian's making this dome stay up is that he's making it lighter as you get closer to the oculus so that you reduce the amount of pressure so that the dome will collapse in under its own weight, which is how domes fail, is that the the curvy vault of the top of the arch is just too heavy. Uh, it's not as stable as a proper arch, and they do have a tendency to collapse in an earthquake. The wider the dome, the more often that these collapses happen. And for a long time, this was the biggest dome ever anywhere. And this was the one to beat. It wasn't that people weren't trying to make a bigger dome. It's just this, this one for quite a while, not forever, but a while. The other thing that he's doing with this is that he's using his concrete very efficiently because the dome doesn't have to support anything except for the dome and this light layer of bronze covering it. It's not load bearing in the same way an arch is load bearing. It's not like holding a window in it or anything. So you don't want to sacrifice lightness for um, toughness or weight. And it worked. It's still there. It's doing quite nicely. Here's what it looks like from the outside. Again, you have to imagine this with paint. It would have been a lot prettier. And you can also see where there's been some um, wonkiness in the replanning. You've got the original porch built by Agrippa, and it's still got Agrippa's name on it. You can read it there. There's an M, and then it says A-G-R-I-P-P-A. -P -P That's Marcus Agrippa. But 
that peak of the roof doesn't quite match the peak that's been built into the new facade behind it. And some of the windows are sort of showing through at an awkward angle. But I don't know. I kind of like it. I think it makes it look like it's sort of got this shadow box behind it. I think it's pretty. I really like this building, just while we're talking about it. You can also see how the dome has been reinforced with these thick round walls built around the sides. Now this is before flying buttresses are a thing. And this is one of the major places where this building could fail because this unsupported round wall is holding the entire weight of the dome pressing down and then outwards. The angle of force here coming out from the dome is gonna be going like this. And that means that this part of the wall here is going to experience a lot of thrust force. So the wall has to be built very thickly to accommodate this. And there are also these reinforcing rings around the side here, 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 that are part of the structure that's meant to be reinforcing against the outward pressure here. Now, eventually, uh, flying buttresses are structures that create, they, here, I'll do this in green. Let's do this in green. So a flying buttress will look like this, and it's basically like building an arch onto the side to take some of that pressure and redirect it away from the building. It's a nifty idea. This is how the cathedrals of Europe solved this design problem. Uh, Romans didn't quite do that yet, although they're, they're getting there. Give them time. Okay, let's look at the inside the inside of the Pantheon, and this is what I mean by the oculus being called uh, the eyeball. Oculus is Latin for eyeball. This is a design feature, yes, but it's also part of the theological structure of this building. The light streaming in from the overhead eyeball creates a shaft of light that moves as the sun moves across the sky during the day and also moves with the seasons, now illuminating one god, now illuminating another god. Um, I'm going to use white for this. Here you can see on the ground floor there are these niches, and then up here there are also other niches too. The large niches were for the statues of all of the gods and then um, subsidiary gods or works of art would be on the second level. So this shaft of light is moving around as the days and the seasons move, featuring a different god at different times of the year, which is nifty. You can still see the colored marble floor, that's original, and there's also green marble inlay on the inner surface of the wall. Uh, the mellow white marble has uh, gotten yellower over time. We're also missing the gold. So the coffers here, you can see these square features on the inside surface of the dome. Those are all molded into the concrete. So those aren't beams or pieces of marble or anything. Those are just built in. And there are optical illusions made to look at, make it, them look taller and deeper. These would have been covered with gilding, so gold leaf and then some paint. So this would have been shiny and otherworldly. It's just a nifty, nifty building. All of it made possible due to our friend Roman concrete. Now this is a sample of Roman water, uh, salt water set in concrete, which isn't quite the formula used to build the Pantheon. Uh, but just so you can see what this looks like on a microscopic level, the little flecks of black are the volcanic stone, and you can also see the gray ash. Uh, included here, too, is um, lime. So you take limestone and you cook it in a kiln, and this causes a chemical change that makes it more reactive. We still do this to make concrete. So modern concrete still sets due to a chemical reaction. It's just not salt water dependent like the Roman version is. I think they're in the process of making a commercial version of this. This is nifty. I hope someday to have a concrete countertop made out of Roman concrete. That would make me very happy. But I'm not that wealthy. Here's a fisheye lens to give you another view of the Pantheon. It's just amazing. 
and then this is as close as you can get without being in it to getting a sense of what it feels like to be in this space. Uh, the engineering is fantastic, but it's also a, a place that has a real feel of spirituality, of connection to the seasons and to nature uh, through the way that light interacts with the internal space. It's really just this otherworldly venue where you can uh, get a sense for the sacredness, yes, of the Roman pantheon, but also the the overwhelming power that this is meant to project. Again, these are the state gods. These are the big ones that are in the state-sponsored temples that are a part of how the imperial family is solidifying power. This is at a time where emperors are now being deified and included into the pantheon. So part of the point of this space is not just to be pious and give glory to the gods, but also to make a point about the power of the emperors as being related to the power of the gods. Overarching is the sky overarches the earth, so too the roof of the pantheon overarches Romans as they come into the space. This is an expression of domination. It's a power move. You now Hadrian's not just doing this because it's his cute little hobby. This is how you make people believe in your power and submit to it and cooperate with it. You know, just keep this in mind. Used in good health, I guess. All right, so from the sublime to the mundane, but still super nifty, we are on to the Roman road structures. Now, Roman roads are a thing that everywhere Romans show up, the roads follow. We used to think that what Romans would do is build new ro roadways and places to mark their newfound command over landscape that they were in the process of conquering. And that's part of what's going on, certainly. But we find a pattern of existing roads covered over with Roman roads. And some of them are decently built roads. So again, Romans aren't the only people who can build roads, and they aren't like super road geniuses who are better than other people because of roads. Uh, uh, it sounds stupid when I say it like this, but I have to say it because there are some people, um, namely the History Channel, who make this big deal out of like, you know, all the Romans and their greatness and their domination because of roads, which is what the Romans want you to think. Um, nevertheless, the, the roads are awesome. And much like the aqueducts, you have all of these roads because you have a lot of bored legions. And when legions get bored, they do stuff that starts rebellions more frequently than they start rebellions. Anyway, so one of the things that Rome would do to keep its soldiers occupied is make them build roads. And this was a win-win because the better the roads, the better the communication, the better the communication, the easier it was for military forts to keep in touch with each other, the easier they could keep in touch with each other, the easier they could intervene when things got violent. So roads are not politically neutral is what I'm saying. Roads structure which towns get which traffic. They structure which people can talk to other people, namely the Roman military. They allow the Roman military to control who's talking to whom and who's traveling where. You can avoid the Roman road system, but you're going to be taking a lot more time to go where you need to go. And if you try to build your own roads, the Romans are sure going to notice because they're, they're on top of that. All of this is to say, part of why Romans are being so extra about their road building is that they have to. One of the best tools of empire is a road system. And if you think about it for a minute, that's still true today, right? Having a good road system means more trade, it means more efficient uh, shipping and maneuvering, it's easier for people to commute into and out of your communities, and it's also just, it, it makes the place seem more stable and better run. 
if you're a politician who keeps the roads looking nice and fills in the potholes like a responsible community leader, then you're going to have political goodwill, but you're also showing that you're an effective leader. Without any further ado then, Roman road structure. They do what we still do if we want to make a road good and solid and last long. Now Roman roads didn't have to put up with the level of vibration that we do with modern traffic because the traffic isn't moving as fast, right? And, and nobody's driving 80 miles an hour down a Roman road until the 20th century. But it still has to handle a lot of frequent variable cartwheel traffic that's going to cause uh, damage to the surface and you need a surface that's going to not crack with variations in temperature, but is also going to be stable. It's going to shed rainwater. It's not going to get muddy. It's going to be as usable as possible for the most months out of the year as possible. Roman roads do that. And this begins with the foundation laying. Now, the one that we're looking at, the Via Appia, is the main road into the city of Rome. And the, there are people down the way a little bit right here. So people give you an idea of the scale here. So the, these aren't very wide. This is wide enough that you can have carts coming one way and they can pass carts going the other way. So these tend not to be too sprawling, but that's for a good reason. The wider the road, the more it has a tendency to dip in the middle, or at least at the wheel ruts, and to cause difficulties for traffic. Now, roadways made for driving sheep are made differently than roadways made for driving cart traffic. Uh, sheep roads tend to have hedges on either side because if you don't have hedges the sheep will just like go everywhere. Um, this particular stretch of road also over the years is built up on the sides as people have cleared off the road. That's made the sides of the road puff up. That's not how it would have been built initially. You can also see in the sides grave monuments. As mentioned earlier, this is where people are buried is outside of the city with these monuments facing the roadside. This is also where you go to pee when you're traveling. But be careful because werewolves hang out here too. So, you know. Yeah, Romans had werewolves. Uh, Roman werewolves, by the way, had a specific supernatural power that I've yet to see in any of the many werewolf books I've read. Namely, werewolves, when they take off their clothing to change into a wolf, pee in a circle around the clothing, and then the clothing turns to stone so nobody can steal it until the werewolf can come back and take up the clothing. Which is just the most Roman thing I've ever heard of. They're really worried about people stealing their clothes because clothes are easy to steal and they're really expensive. So, you know, put that in your next werewolf romance novel. I think you can make it work. Okay, I thought about that way too much. <clears throat> okay, so back to our road then. At the very bottom, you start with sand and then you work your way up to larger and larger particle sizes before putting the pavement at the top. This is because grittier structures allow water to pass through, but you don't want the water to pass through too quickly because then it will wash out the bottom of the road and cause a sinkhole. So the idea is to allow initial rainfall to fall very quickly away from the road surface through the cracks and the slabs at the top. And then also on the sides of the roads, you'll see that the top of the road, turn my red pen back on again, is domed. This is so that water is shedding to the sides. There are gutters and they can do that because the top surface isn't watertight and that's a feature. But also large bits of rainwater are going to slush onto the sides and they're going to flow in channels next to the road. And you need to do this because otherwise the paved surface is going to create a river. And if your road turns into a river, you've defeated the entire purpose of having a road. So it's important to keep the road a little bit higher than its drainage ditch sides. But the water that does go through the system is going to filter into the gravel and the mortar 
and then it's going to be slowed into the rock. By the time it gets to the sand, it's still draining through, but it's draining through slowly enough that it can soak into the dirt at the base of the road. This means that the road isn't going to have as much washout potential, it's not going to have as much damage to the surface, and it's going to last a really long time. The major maintenance issue for these roads isn't so much in the substructure, it's in the wear on the paving stones and paving stones coming a little loose. So not so much potholes and sinkholes, but you do have to replace the paving as it gets worn down over time. But that's pretty easy to do. You just go in and honk another rock in there and carry on about your way. On to our next big thing for this lecture, and that is Roman baths. We're going to be looking at a giant bath for this one. These are the baths of Caracalla, and these are more massive than your average bathhouse. Uh, they tend to be much smaller than this. But it's nice in that it shows you everything that's in a bathhouse, because bathhouses aren't just for taking a bath, although that's part of what you're doing in there. But they're also a community center, they're a shopping area. That whole front level, right through here, with the porches and the colonnades, that's a shopping mall. So as you walk in, there's a mall. A lot of these places seem to have had like doctor's offices, massage parlors, uh, hairdressers, cosmetics people. Uh, you could also buy oils to use in the bath and nice outfits if you were a lady going to the bath. Inside the bath grounds itself, you have gardens all the way around. So, so this, all of this here are gardens. And then here and here on the sides where there are apses, those are libraries, a Greek language library and a Latin language library. You could take out books and you were expected to read aloud as you walked. It was a form of exercise. So you'd take your book, you'd go out into the sunny garden and you'd walk around reading to yourself. Or you like bring friends and you'd read aloud to your friends as you walked through the gardens. And that was part of your exercise regimen, especially if you were doing a low impact exercise regimen. It's a really regular way of getting your workout. And then at the back here, these are the palaestrae, which is a fancy word for wrestling rooms. And this is where you would go if you were doing a full on gym rat workout. You'd wrestle with your friends. Uh, wrestling is the primary thing you do in here, but you could also lift weights. You could meet with your personal trainer. You could you know, do all of the things you need to do to get nice and swole. And there's a running track here at the back too if track and field is more of your thing. So let me erase all of that. Erase, 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 erase. There we go. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So now into the part of the bath with water where you're actually getting clean. That's this central bit here. Let me go around that. This is our, our marker. And change to my yellow highlighter here. At the center with um, this kind of housey dome on it, this is the bit that's um, hot and heated up with furnaces. And then as you get further away from that, you have less and less warm rooms for different temperatures and different bath services. At the center, there's this uh, open courtyard that's pretty typical here. Now, some of these places did have men and women's baths or they'd have different hours. A lot of them were unisex though because bathing wasn't necessarily a sexualized process. Now I'm hesitating a little bit on the necessarily because we do know that just as personal trainers and physicians and cosmetologists would hang out in the baths, also, you would have sex workers as a regular part of the baths. So one of the sorts of exercise, if you were inclined to that sort of thing, you could pick up at the baths would be a um, sexy times friend for the sexy times having. Now, now I'm going to save that until we get to the locker room. So let's take a tour, shall we? Okay. This is a diagram of the rooms of a bathhouse, and baths are built 
each of them in a different floor plan. So this is pretty variable. But the general principle is that you're using a system of what we call hypo costs. This is an underfloor heating system in order to control the relative temperature of one room to another room. And this allows you to create rooms that are colder or hotter, depending on their proximity to the furnace and how many spaces you include for hot air to flow into and around that room. I've got another diagram with the rooms labeled in English rather than Latin, but this I like because it gives you a nice cutaway view of the hypocost system. Hypocostum is what it's got spelled out there. And then it shows a little bit of the boiler room. You can see up here there are these uh, jars. So these are the hot water vessels being heated before delivery to the bath itself. All of this would have been operated by a bunch of enslaved bathhouse operators. If it were imperial bathhouses, these might be civil servants. Sometimes they were privately owned or quasi privately owned. They would be in charge of making sure that everything was heated up, that stuff got cleaned. Uh, ancient sources suggest that the cleaning didn't happen as frequently as one might have wished. Bathhouses were probably pretty manky, I can say. And this is why it's tempting to look at this and be like, oh, yeah, they're bathing, there's hygiene. And yeah, OK, they are bathing and there is hygiene. But this is a space where sick people would go to more frequently than well people. But they'd still be hanging out in populations of sick people going to the baths for their health with healthy people who were just going to the bath to bathe. They're sharing bath water. They're packed in very closely into um, crowded rooms where everybody's sweating together and then they're going off to wrestle. This is already a pretty good environment for disease transmission, but you've got a lot of nice warm-ish rooms. The very, very hot rooms might be hot enough to kill some of the gunk growing in there, but most of these rooms are hot and humid for long periods of time with lots of people going in and leaving their grimy griminess. So much so that one of the pharmaceutical products coming from the baths that was used in preparations was this stuff called RuPaul's. So we'll talk about what RuPaul's is later, but it's gross, so stay tuned. Now I mentioned that workouts were one of the things you would do in the bathhouses, and here are some ladies doing a workout. This is from a bathhouse in Britain, in the city of London, showing not just women working out, but women involved in an athletic competition. We can tell it's competitive because this lady's doing what you do when you win. She's got a palm branch in her arm. You get a palm branch when you win an athletic competition, and she's crowning herself with the victor's crown. So she's won something. We're not sure what, but she won. Go her. So this is a great source of art for the history of women in athletics. Not the only source, though. Women's athletics were a thing in the ancient world. Not on the scale that men's athletics were, but eh, it's a thing. And it was competitive, and it does seem to have been something that uh, certain women took very, very seriously. So if you're a lady athlete, you exist in the ancient world, too. Go you. They're wearing uh, subligarian fascia, so they're the underpants thingies and the kind of bra breastband things. We have found these made out of leather, as I mentioned in the underwear lecture. We found one in the River Thames. There are a few more we found. But that seems to have been a, a fashion statement as much as anything. Uh, we probably see, a, or no, we probably see, I'm being hedgy because this kind of garment just doesn't survive. It ends up as rags and then used to death. But Literary evidence suggests that regularly out under your clothes, you'd wear this made of linen, maybe wool, but linen is better. It doesn't stretch out as much over time. So probably these women are mostly wearing linen wraps, but we also do find athletic wear made out of leather too. Leather doesn't feel great in the hot, moist environment of a bathhouse, but it also has a tendency to stay on you a bit better than other forms of natural fabrics. 
dealer's choice, I guess. The other thing going on here that I find interesting, let me also point out, she's got barbells, so hand weights are a thing. And then here we've got a foot race, uh, she's tossing, tossing a discus. And then these two are playing a game called small ball, because it's a small ball, but we know that's the name of the game. We don't know what the rules are. Some athletic historians have tried to figure out the rules of small ball. It, it seems to have been a little bit like hacky sack maybe, but this was a big time sport that was regularly played by people of all ages. I mentioned wrestling is a thing you do in the gym. Um, not so much for women's workouts, this was very gendered, but for men, and not just men who were professional wrestling athletes either, this was a regular part of how you would work out with your male friends if you yourself were a male person in ancient Rome. You and your buddies would all go to the bathhouse, you would take off your clothes, you'd cover yourself in olive oil, and then you'd dust yourself in a gritty sandy mixture, and then you would wrestle with each other, like these guys are doing here. They have a trainer with them helping them and also acting as a referee, and you'd you know, grapple with each other until you were nice and hot and sweaty, and then you'd go to the next bits of the bath. But putting on olive oil, working putting on olive oil and a little bit of dust and then working out is an essential step in the bathing process as well as the workout process. The grit is there partially to give some traction for the grapple checks that you're you're doing while you're wrestling with your friends, but it's also part of the exfoliation process here. All right, so in the bathhouse proper, also this is part of the athletic bit, Women, too, although there, this seems to have varied a lot more by place, uh, some women would work out still in their underwear, some seem to have worked out naked just like men, uh, but men definitely would be naked for the bath. And for the bathing part, women also would be naked for this. Uh, this, again, wasn't a highly sexualized process uh, in and of itself. And indeed, it wasn't for well into the, the 1400s. We have this vision of the Middle Ages as being this bath-free zone. Uh, that's not correct. That's the Renaissance, actually. Um, before the Renaissance, bathhouses were a thing that you'd have in the medieval city that people would go to. Uh, they got associated with prostitution at one point, which is why you had to move away from them. But for most of the Middle Ages, people took baths. Sorry. Uh, now, again, we're about to talk about why that uh, isn't necessarily good hygiene news, but, uh, you know, it's unfair to think of medieval people as grody. That's uh, unkind. All right. So here we are looking at the apoditarium, which is the Greek word for the take it off place. Which is great because that's what you do with it. Um, side note, the word gymnasion or gymnasium in it Greek means the place of the naked people because you work out in the nude. Therefore, the gym is the place where you go to get naked for working out. You'll notice there aren't any doors on the locker. Yeah, that's because the security system wasn't doors with locks. Rather, you would leave your enslaved attendant to watch your stuff while you went off to take your bath. They're very high up to make it hard to reach into them without somebody noticing, but essentially your lock for the locker was the enslaved person you brought with you. If you were extra fancy, you'd bring an enslaved person to help you bathe too. So this is something like a lot of other stuff in Rome that doesn't happen without some sort of labor. If you didn't own someone, then you'd go with friends and you'd get your friends to do this kind of bathing stuff that you need extra hands to do. And this was considered perfectly fine. It wasn't sexualized. However, I did mention there's a story about sex in locker rooms. And that has to do with this one team we know about because of a poem of Catullus. I didn't have you read this one. But apparently, and, and here's where it gets depressing, there was this father-son clothing stealing ring working out of a bathhouse in Rome during Catullus's time 
where the son was the sex worker um, trafficked by his father. And while the son was with the client, the father would go steal the client's clothing out of the locker room. And then when the, the client got back to the locker, ah, the clothing would be gone. But that would have been a really great business model if you were slightly nefarious in ancient Rome and didn't care about trafficking your kid. Which is, ugh. But that, it, that doesn't seem to be like a typical everyday locker room experience. Mostly it's just people coming in, taking off their clothes, and getting ready to go get hot and bathe. Next up, and here I'm going to go from coldest to hottest, just to make it easier to keep this in your mind. But this isn't the order that you would bathe in. That would be variable. The order of hot to cold rooms that you would bathe in was dependent on the season, your personal preference, your situation. And one of the things that ancient doctors would do is that they would prescribe bathing regimens that would be keyed to your specific health condition. So how long you spend in the hot bits of the bath, how, uh, when you jump into the cold pool, all of this would be something that varies. At any rate, the frigidarium is pretty much what it sounds like. This is the cold room because it has no places for hot air to come in. If you look at the subfloor here on our illustration, let me turn back to my highlighter here. Is it? Oh, yellow is not showing up. Great. Should have gone with the pen. Ugh, yellow is a really unfortunate choice of colors for a swimming pool, isn't it? Alrighty. So there's the major plunge pool. Now, Frigidaria cold rooms don't always have a plunge pool in them. This is a nice extra for fancy cold rooms. Some of them just have a basin of water that you can splash in if it's low rent. But underneath the floor, you see it's just like foundation stones. There isn't any place for warm air to come from below. That's how it stays cold. So this is as cold as marble that isn't in the sun can get. Often this has a domed roof, which you can see here. It's the oculus of the domed roof of this particular nice frigidarium. Now, sometimes these would have large swimming pools, but usually it's just a plunge pool. And this performs a function similar to jumping in a cold lake if you're going to a Swedish sauna. You just jump in this to really quickly close up your pores and uh, firm things up. There's this belief that warmness increased the warmth in your body and caused it to relax and let go of stuff like the whole idea that sweating out makes toxins like sweat out of your body is a really old idea this comes from roman ideas about how the human body worked and this idea that you have these pores these passageways in your body that let out stuff or close up to keep stuff in the frigidarium use the idea that coldness causes these pores to close up and it causes your flesh to firm up and, and contract a bit. So the idea that cold water closes your pores, that there is Roman. Next, we have the tepidarium, which is just what it sounds like. It is the tepid water room and not necessarily tepid either. Now this is even more water optional than the Frigidarium. You don't even need a splash basin for this room. You just have a, a room that was room temperature. The large windows would allow it to stay kind of roomy temperature. And this was meant to be a nice medium neutral room. It often though had a large pool in it for paddling around. It normally wasn't deep enough to swim in and they tend to be round pools too, so not really structured for lap swimming or anything. Um, swimming as exercise doesn't seem to be as much of a thing as just hanging out in the water with your friends. This was used to reset your body between stages if you didn't want to shock your body by going really hot to really cold. This was also a meeting and gathering room, and a lot of other stuff would happen in here besides the bathing and hanging out with your friends. Often business meetings would happen here too. Uh, we find gaming pieces, so people would gamble, they'd um, buy stuff. Often 
cosmetic services would happen here. So you might go here to get your shave and your hair cut, uh, to get your body waxed. Body waxing was a big business for ancient folks. And we find a lot of tweezers in this bit of bathhouses. Next up, the hottest of the hot, the caldarium and laconicum. So a caldarium is a hot room, usually with a hot tub. Um, in fact, almost always with a hot tub in it. A laconicum is an even hotter room that doesn't necessarily have a tub in it. This is a dry heat room. So the caldarium is for wet heat. It's a steamy, steamy sauna hot tub room. The laconicum generally has a sand floor. There'll be like a ceramic floor that there would be sand on top of. And then the floor and the walls would be heated really hot. This is right next to the furnace. And it would be like sweltering, nasty, dry heat. Well, nasty, dry heat. And at the very end, you see this space in here, this is a splash pool, so you can splash your face. Now, this could get very dangerous because thermostats aren't an invention in the ancient world. And if you stay long enough, you could give yourself heat stroke, you could die, and people could and did cook themselves to death while sitting in Caldaria and Laconica. So just be careful. Here's the floor plan to a caldarium, and I like this because it includes a cutaway that shows you the mechanics behind these rooms as well as the bits of it themselves. Everywhere you see these structures, you see these hollow bricks, these are made out of terracotta, and the ceramic is really good for retaining and radiating heat over time. Similarly, the subfloor has these open air spaces that are held up by stacks of more tiles. So these ceramic tiles allow air to pass around the columns, but the columns themselves heat up, retain heat, and then radiate the heat upwards into the room. And this is the general principle used for indoor heating all over the Roman Empire. They're really into this um, closed central heating system where you'd have a single furnace and then you'd use the principles of um, air distribution. Uh, the less dense hot air would be sucked up through the flues and the chimneys into colder areas of the house. And this would permeate the house and heat it from the floors and the, the walls. So the furnace first shoots its hot air into the floor, then hot air, as hot air does, rises because it's less dense. So it goes up these chimney flues here, 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 and here, heating the walls as well as the floor. This and this are both tubs for water. Um, green tub here, because it has heating flues on all sides and underneath, is going to be the hottest water. This is going to be super, super hot. And this is air coming right off the furnace. So this would be almost hot enough to boil, really. I like dangerous hot. This is where you end up getting cooked accidentally, is spending too long in there. Slightly safer, but not as hot, is... Let's do this in purple. Our purple tub over here, you'll notice that there are ceramic tiles around the edges, and all of this is sealed in waterproof concrete, but there aren't these hollow flue tiles. So while the floor of this tub, so down here, there's heat, the walls, however, aren't heated and they're nice and thick, so that's going to keep this water relatively cool. So part of how they would try not to die doing this is that they'd heat themselves up and then cool themselves down and then go back for more heat and then try to use that to balance out into a general heated experience. You can also see where through this door is yet another room with subfloor heating and then wall heating. That's the laconicum, so there'd be sand on that floor and you'd use that to get really, really hot. This is the Chedworth Laconicum in Chedworth, England, and this is just a, another view of all of these structures, not in a reconstruction, but in actual ruin form, still with a little bit of the mosaic floor. 
and you can see here the subfloor heating yeah and it's missing a lot of its chimney flues but you can still get the idea Okay, so here's another cutaway view, this time focusing on the water and heating system. You'll notice that uh, there's just a central furnace. This is on the edge of the building, and this would be kept stoked during all of the operating hours in order to maintain the heat in the structure. The furnace is right below the boiler, so we're using the hottest area very efficiently for creating the hottest water and that just heated boiling water is going right into the tub and then as this water cools it sinks to the bottom and then it circulates back to the boiler tub so this maintains a constant hot water temperature in the pool just as the air from the furnace is being sucked into the subfloor this away and then up into the rest of the system. Now as you get further away from the furnace and this hot air mixes with the cold air in the system, it's going to become slowly cooler and cooler and that's the principle used to create this gradual cooling effect through the building. Up at the top you see the ventilator flue where the waste air is expelled. If this is all properly sealed, this means that although you're heating with wood or sometimes coal, but mostly wood, you're not putting any smoke into the building itself. Now, if you're working in the furnace room, yeah, you're breathing in a lot of smoke. But in general, this means you're in a warm, warm room where you're not breathing in wood smoke. And that's a huge quality of life thing. It's also much better for your health because breathing in wood smoke over time does give you lung disease. It's just not recommended. Now, there are other things you're breathing in here that will likely give you even worse lung diseases like black mold, say, but you know, it's another problem for another stage of the bathing. And this is another cutaway to show you what this looks like under the floor. I'm not going to talk about this too much. You can get the idea looking at it. Now, I mentioned that the strigil was going to be coming up again. Here it is again. This here's a strigil. These curved metal blades are strigils. And our friends on the bottom are demonstrating what the strigil is for. Once you've covered yourself with oil and covered yourself with dust and wrestled with your friends and gone and hung out in the sauna and dipped into a couple of pools, now you are ready for the final stage in your cleaning process. Usually you do this in the tepidarium, uh, not the frigidarium usually, it's more of a tepidarium thing. You and your friends all hang out and you run these scraper blades over the surface of your skin. The pressure causes the oil that you've let sit in your hot exercising open pores to squish back out. Uh, this is the same principle that informs oil cleansing methods for those of you who are familiar with oil cleansing as a cosmetic strategy. And if you're not and you have acne, you might as well try it. It's um, helpful, at least for me and my stupid pizza face, even though I'm almost 40. Why do I still have acne when I'm 40? It's stupid. Sorry. <clears throat> at any rate, now, Soap, the advantage of soap is that it breaks down oils and strips them, which is why we do it to stop the microbes. But this is also one of the problems with soap is it's an indiscriminate destroyer of microbes. So your beneficial skin flora can also be destroyed by soaps and detergents. Oil doesn't do that, so it lets you develop a healthy skin bacteria. And this informs what's about to happen next. This is the gross part. So you take your oily skin, you press the blade against it, you scrape it along, and it pulls up this combination of dust and oil and skin cells and general glurk from the surface of your skin. And then once you've filled up your blade, you'll notice the inside of the blade is hollow. That's so it's, it can pick up the glurk. You don't like throw it in a glurk bucket. Rather, you take this sludge and you fling it off the edge of your strigil blade onto the floor and you hope somebody's gonna clean it up. And they do, eventually, because uh, gym trainers often would have a secondary business as health advisors, uh, the same way that your 
personal trainer is often a wellness and diet advisor too. And that's, this means they would be treating illnesses, especially illnesses that impacted cosmetic function. There is also a belief that athlete sweat had special properties that you could get some of that athletic goodness from an athlete's body and use it to heal yourself if your body was, say, underperforming or not vigorous enough. So what they do is they take this sludge, they called it a rupos, and they would resell it. If it makes you feel better, they're mostly using it for anal fissures, and there are a lot of anal fissures in this culture because they're wiping their butt with rocks sometimes if they don't have a sponge on a stick handy. Now, the best case explanation for why this isn't a horrible idea is that this would have been a culture of mostly healthy skin tissue, including healthy skin bacteria. The oil and the skin cells would help it to stay active and live so that when you put it onto skin with an invasive infection, then it might uh, outcompete the invasive bacteria and allow the skin to heal. This isn't a ludicrous idea. It's still the principle behind certain prescription uh, wound care substances, in including mupiracin, so it's not totally out to lunch, but I still don't think this is a great idea because with all of that, you're going to get mold and bacteria. Now, again, people who are trying to make a, a sunny argument for this are saying, oh yeah, but it might grow penicillium, so it might like have antibiotics in it. Yeah, it might, or it might have like strep. So also, not everybody who's scraping their bodies in the bathhouse is a healthy athlete. You've got a lot of people with skin conditions in the bath, so I, I just, this isn't a hard no for me. I just don't think so. Interestingly enough, it was a hard no for some Romans, too. Uh, Pliny the Elder found this absolutely disgusting, and he included it in this list of bullshit remedies gym trainers try to sell you. So, hey, Pliny the Elder. I'm with you on this one. Skin glurk is disgusting. But apparently there was a lot of it just lying there in the bath. So when you imagine going to a Roman bath, don't imagine like a nice, clean marble edifice. Imagine this place with lots of lots of lots of people, quote, a lot of them coughing in this closed space, kind of packed in together with slimy, icky walls and overgrowth mold and um poorly motivated enslaved people cleaning it and of course they're poorly motivated because they're enslaved so uh, the ultimate yes no um, were roman baths helpful for hygiene well yes and no romans did bathe a lot and a lot of the things they were doing to bathe were great things to do to bathe it certainly meant regular exercise in a social environment, but a lot of bad things were happening there too, including a lot of body shaming, especially for men. This was a culture, as I've mentioned earlier, that policed men's bodies minutely and relentlessly, and therefore it's not surprising that the eating disorders we hear from in the ancient world, most of the people with them are male. This was a time where men would regularly ruin their health trying to get athlete bod, and ancient doctors were really disturbed by this. Because, you know, toxic is toxic. Now, I said that we find a lot of tweezers in bathhouses, and we do. Here is just a tiny selection of stuff found. I think this is the bathhouses in Bath, England including cosmetic applicators slash pharmaceutical instruments, the same instruments used for both. Uh, do you see this blade here in the middle, this kind of scary looking leaf-shaped blade? This is a lancet. This is used to cut veins in order to bleed people. And this is evidence that medicine is being practiced in the baths by either doctors or gym trainers. We also have a lot of tweezers. Tweezers are used both for surgical procedures and for cosmetics. And then the scale here too, this very tiny scale, would be used to weigh and compound drugs and cosmetics. So uh, this is 
a beautician's kit. There's also this uh, whetstone here for sharpening razor blades. All of this would be used for your manscaping needs. You'll notice the body norms that we've seen when we've looked at naked Roman people, naked Roman men, not even the older guys, not a lot of body hair, yes. When was the last time you saw a lot of Italian men without body hair? Is all I'm saying. There was a lot of manscaping going on in the ancient world and a lot of policing of like how much manscaping is too much manscaping. Oh, bless their hearts. Darlin problematic Romans. But I'm going to leave you with a happy, tranquil image of a Roman garden from Pompeii. If you're wealthy, this is the kind of environment that you get to walk around and do your exercise reading. This is an urban villa too, so inside the city of Pompeii you'd still have this enclosed environment with this pretty hedgerow with fountains that you could splash in. Really nice houses also had private baths where you could go with your family and you wouldn't have to share other people's icky skin gunk. Uh, so, you know, hygiene for Romans definitely was a thing. It's just hygiene for upper class Romans. The further you get away from this end of the spectrum, the more the win-lose benefit analysis of hygiene gets a little uh, uneven and disturbing. But I said I'd leave you on a happy thought. So here, here is the happy thought. Romans had plumbing! And they could make that plumbing indoor, but also, and here's where they do get a bit of a gold star from me. I've, I've been super sh shady about this, but they did let poor people have some of that water. And they did think it was important to provide access to hygiene and wellness to regular people at low cost. Often this was done by wealthy people to kind of brag. You know, we called the Baths of Caracalla the Baths of Caracalla because the Emperor Caracalla built them to put his name and his face all over them. So everybody was like, yay, Caracalla, he's an awesome emperor. Thank you for the baths, right? It's not something that you just do because you want to be nice any more than Pompey made a theater because he just wanted to be nice. He wanted people to be like, Pompey is awesome. I will vote for his policies. But Nonetheless, this is a society that does place value on creating spaces where sick people can get rehabilitated, where people in crowded urban environments can go to work out, where people can go to have access to body care and treatment. And this is also a society that values wellness and doesn't consider it incompatible with the rest of your life too. Business meetings are happening in the bathhouses. Some of them have court spaces in them too. Uh, this is a, a society that integrates health and wellness and working out with the rest of its life for a lot of people in the society. Now, access is gonna be limited if you're enslaved or if you're working and not in a position to have a lot of this free time, but it does seem to have been something that most Romans did and felt was fine and important. And so to the best of their abilities, they are investing in the kind of things that led to a generally on balance, better than average health situation in the cities. Certainly without the aqueducts and the bathhouses, well, Rome couldn't have gotten as big as it did, but also Rome couldn't have functioned as well as it did. Now it still had a higher disease rate than it had a self-replacing population. It needed regular influxes of immigration to remain functional and to have enough population to survive. But it would have been a lot worse if Rome hadn't been willing to invest in infrastructure. So my takeaway thought from all of this is that infrastructure is sexy and maintaining it is important. And this isn't something that we should be super salty about when there are tax levies to have it. We should be excited to pony up money for this if we possibly can. And of all of the things to spend our government money on, infrastructure is the one that gives you the highest rate of return, not just now, but for generations to come. But also cutting corners on infrastructure is a false economy because you, when you invest in health 
and access and basics like running water, you are freeing up time and space for people to live better lives and to, if you want to think about people like this, I think it's a bit icky, but to be more productive. Which is why if there is lead in your pipe system, you should suck it up and pay money to take the lead out of the pipe systems, goddammit. <clears throat> okay, that's where I'm going to leave you. Take care, be well, stay classy, and I'll see you in the next lecture. I think we're talking about religion? Yes, possibly Roman Britain, but also religion.